Um, okay, um, welcome everybody back. Um, nice to see so many of you again. Um, uh, it's a very cold and frosty morning here in Scotland. Um, yeah, um, so <clears throat> I'm sorry. Let's um, start uh, with the lecture just uh, in a second. I'm sharing my screen. Um, Okay, do you see the screen? Yes, that works. It works well? Yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, um, so uh, we had two lectures already together. So the first one was uh, about biological background of, of epigenomics. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that and you saw the um, opportunities um, in epigenomic research. I think it's a super interesting, fascinating area uh, to study um, because it's on the one hand really relevant to how cells work and um, it's still quite mysterious and there's a lot to be discovered. Um, so in case uh, you're searching for a research topic, I can um, really highly um, recommend epigenomics. So on the second day, on Tuesday, um, it was a lot more technical and I showed you some of uh, the approaches that we are taking um, using machine learning for imputation and da data analysis. And I think we really looked into some of the challenges um, in interpreting and analyzing these um, very, very complex data sets. Um, but it's also very fascinating and you can apply all kinds of um, new techniques and think about how you model the data and so on. So, um, so really um, interesting work. Today will be a little bit different. Um, yet. So we had biology, we had a bit of machine learning. So I want to um, put it into a bigger, wider context. And it's also being going to be a little bit historical. And I'm a bit nervous about this lecture, I have to say. It contains some of the material I used in a recent genetics lecture. And um, I think it's, it's highly relevant as, as well for us as scientists uh, to think about these bigger questions. So I started a little bit chokingly as an introduction in the first lecture with this slide, with my DNA, with a bit of DNA sequence saying, um, you know, if you introduce someone, uh, you tell them a little bit about their past. And of course, some people would think that a lot of information is already present in my DNA. So if I want to introduce myself to you, I could show you my DNA. And that's of course, just a choke. But it's not just a joke, because you all know that nowadays you can get um, these kind of tests for relatively uh, little money. Um, and you can send away a sample of your genome, uh, of your, um, you can send away a sample and get, get your sequence, uh, genome sequenced. And it doesn't cost you very much. And then you get a whole bunch of information. So this is all done um, commercially and, and routinely now. And there's lots of um, genomes. Um, uh, collected and stored uh, <clears throat> as well. But this is your private data and the results that you would get from such a test um, include a number of different aspects. So what does um, the genome tell you about me? Well, there's the first very obvious questions. Um, I have uh, two X chromosomes, so um, apparently my sex would be female. Um, there are some traits that can be um, very easily picked up in my genome. So for example, skin pigmentation. Um, so actually skin pigmentation is inherited in a rather complex way and we don't quite understand um, all aspects of it yet. Uh, there's lots of genes involved in, in the inheritance of um, skin pigmentation, but we can make a very good um, prediction given our, um, our genome, what kind of color our skin would have. Um, we could also get something, uh, some information about how likely I am to um, consume coffee. Um, I can confirm that. Um, so I have to say these results are actually, I haven't done this test for myself, um, but this is educational material that I'm presenting you with uh, here. And of course, there's some information that I, I'm, I'm disclosing um, to you, um, not based on my genome. But it's actually quite true. I do like to, to have my, uh, to consume my coffee. Um, uh, I do like uh, good coffee, so that's uh, I would like to, to be with you there uh, in Italy, but um, Scottish coffee is, is improving. Um, and of course, there is some more serious stuff that the genome tells you about me. So 
there's um, a, a genetic health uh, report, uh, mainly about risks. So what kind of diseases could I be developing in the future? Um, so for example, Parkinson disease, do have certain variants to have a, um, a bigger risk of developing this disease or late onset Alzheimer's disease and so on. But it's not only about me, of course, that this um, uh, information, um, that this uh, data uh, contains information about. Uh, so go it goes way beyond me. So it also tells you about uh, what has been there before me. Um, so about my past, uh, it tells you about my ancestry. It will tell you that um, probably mainly German, uh, mainly European, but there's probably quite a lot of other um, ancestry um, mixed into it. Um, so what could that be? Um, it also tells you something about the future. So um, about potentially um, what happens if I would have children? Um, do I have a carrier status uh, for some cert for certain diseases? Um, so it tells you that my the genome um, tells you something about me in the present, something about me in the past, my ancestry, where my people came from. And it also tells you quite a lot about um, potential future uh, generations. So it is a, a very powerful um, data set. And some people would even argue that um, this deep sequ with, with sequencing and um, deep, deep learning techniques you can even read more out of these uh, genomes. So they would claim that even before you're born, you can make a dis um, prediction about, for example, IQ. And um, in relation to that, even fate outcomes, life fate outcomes. And that's of course um, quite massive and that's that's huge, big claims. Um, but it's true. So we, are in, we inherit each one of us a huge library um, of information, um, which is, um, to some extent hidden in our genome, but in uh, more and more we can, um, we can um, uh, it's not as hidden anymore as it used to be. Um, but when I started talking to you about epigenomics, I would also introduce epigenomics as um, the, the question, what of these books do we actually read? So um, the cell cells never access the whole of the DNA. They only access certain programs of it. And that determines the particular function and phenotype of every given cell. Um, so I've said it, it really matters which, which book we read in order to determine uh, which, which phenotypes, which character um, the cell eventually takes on, whether it's a neuron cell or, 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 or um, muscle cell or fibroblast or what have you. So it matters which books we choose to read or which books we have an opportunity to read. So of course, there's a lot of information about me um, that is not stored in my DNA, okay? So for example, about my education, um, so that I, uh, I can disclose here that I grew up and went to school in Germany in the 1990s. I studied physics in Germany and France. I hold a PhD in computer science and machine learning. My main research focus, uh, as you have guessed, is computational epigenomics. I have been living in Scotland for the last 10 years. That was very influential on me, and I'm also a parent. So none of this is none of none of this information is stored in your in my DNA. Um, and of course, there are other things that are really important to know as well. It's like, do I have financial interests? Do I have, what is my available income? What are my, the housing conditions in which I, I live? What is my face political orientation and all so on? So, so there's a lot of things that make, make me make up who I am, what kind of things I'm, um, I'm interested in. And it's not just my genome. I think we can agree on that. So why does it matter? Why does it matter? Um, why, why should I be talking about me in, in the first place in our, in our um, science um, class? Um, so there was a very um, interesting article um, by Angelina Saini in uh, Nature. Uh, I think it was a nature, it was a commentary uh, in 2020. And she asked, um, do you want to do better science? Well, you have to admit that you are not objective, that your science is not done in isolation, um, that you, you come with, with some baggage. And if you admit that you are not objective, you will be doing better science. Um, so what does that have to do with that lecture? Well, I think it has to do um, a lot with the lecture because 
the question we ask as scientists and the answers we find are shaped by who we are and the roles we play in the world. And I think it's very important to understand that. Um, it is also important to understand that what I teach is to the best of my knowledge based on well-established facts and reproducible science, but how I present it to you, the, the, the selection that I make, the ordering, the weights I give to different points is very highly determined by my, my own framework. So as you follow my teaching, you will see the scientific facts through the lens of my filters. OK, so I cannot claim that I'm giving you objective scientific facts. You will see them presented through my filters. And that's true for all of the lectures that you've been hearing uh, in this winter school. It's been true for my epigenomics lecture and also for my um, understanding of deep learning interpretation of, um, 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 of the data. And that brings us to another question, of course. What about data? So. If you are kind of taking the human factor out of the picture, then surely um, we can do objective science, right? And um, so one of the very influential books for me was this book by Judea Pearl, um, the book of Phi, um, and um, where he's um, trying to move beyond um, correlation and introduces um, causality. And um, he, um, he says in that book, um, data alone are hardly a science, regardless how big they get and how skillfully they are manipulated. So, um, and the reason for that is, of course, that the very act of measuring and collecting data involves interpretation and value judgments. So, this problem about objectivity um, cannot be completely removed out of our, our study subject if we are just following the data, because we are still measuring, collecting, and interpreting data. So the human factor is very important here. And I think it's very important to keep in mind also that when we are studying um, genomics or epigenomics, um, um, we are really studying not just a disease, not just a cell type, not just uh, a mechanism, but to some extent we are, we, we are our own study object. So it has a lot to do about who we are in the world, how we connect to others and so on. So it is very important that we keep in mind that in this area in particular, um, we come with a lot of um, we come with a lot of judgment and values and we have to question those um, if we get along to do better science. Um, so I think apart from um, our personal perspective, our in this, the fact that we are we are approaching science as individuals, um, there's a history. Um, we have to also think about um, uh, the, the bigger picture that science doesn't happen, that we are not isolated, but it happens in the, uh, in the context of, um, of the past, of past scientific events, um, past historical events, and of, in the context of politics. And again, so science cannot be tr treated completely independently or uh, independent of that. So I have already said, um, we have been talking about um, genomics and all the data that is available, the individual, the personal um, information that is stored in our given um, uh, genome. Um, now we are looking, I've been looking at epigenomics uh, and for example, we are trying to find maybe epigenetic biomarkers to predict diseases or to, um, to, to, uh, to use them uh, as th therapeutic um, targets. And these are offers huge opportunities, of course. Um, however, um, we have also come to understand that um, the epigenome, to some extent, is potentially even more powerful than the genome because it does incorporate um, uh, sources of uh, variation um, that are coming from the outside. So they include lifestyle um, components. So for example, um, our individual decisions, whether we smoke or not smoke, has an influence on local epigenomics of cell types. It has an in, um, environmental exposures, um, can change our epigenome. These can be uh, individual um, exposures or um, having to do with choices or things that we can't avoid. And of course, we also have the genetic background. So all of these um, together play a, a big role in epigenomics. And then we have also scientific limitations. Um, so in many cases, it's really difficult still to infer causality. 
So to invoke causal associations and not merely significant statistical associations. And it's really hard to distinguish drivers versus passenger um, AP mutations. It is also really difficult to establish a reference epigenome. Um, I think I have that in the next slide. Yes. Um, so as I have tried to show you is um, we do not have a unique epigenome to our lifetime. We have every cell has its own epigenome, but in addition, it changes um, uh, over time. It changes uh, due to aging. It changes due to exposures to environmental stimuli or um, pathological situations. Um, so, so that 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 is is causing that that means that this is quite a challenging topic. In addition to that, um, usually we are trying to compare a normal state versus a, pathological, a pathological state in order to infer causes to some extent. And uh, here it's really difficult if we don't have a unique unique epigenome during our lifetime. Um, it is also quite in, uh, difficult to constitute what, what is a normal reference epigenome. Um, so we have talked about um, ENCODE and the uh, ENCODE um, uh, challenges uh, to predict um, uh, a reference epigenome. We found that it's actually quite difficult to validate that these, um, which of these data sets are the, the, the correct ones. Um, there's, there's other in, uh, initiatives, for example, the International Human Epigenome Consortium, um, which is also a global consortium with the primary goal of setting up high resolution reference human epigenome maps for normal and disease cell types. Um, so there's a lot of data sets already available. But in order to make um, to make this jumping into uh, uh, to, to make the translational um, jump uh, to make epigenomic um, um, research really valuable for the individual, um, we need to generate huge large volumes of personal data um, that currently is that would be accumulated in secure databases. And um, with that, of course. Um, we do have to think also about potential harms of misuse. And I don't want to say that, I have already said in the beginning, I think epigenomics is an amazing field to study. It's an ama amazing re research field. It has amazing opportunities. But of course, I think as we go along, we have to also consider, um, is there, are there potential harms and is, is there potential misuse um, cases? And how can we, um, how can we, um, inform the how can we design the, the our research questions and frame it such that we can avoid most um, these harms. And um, we have already seen in the genomics um, uh, in the in other areas where machine learning is used um, that um, we we do get um, harmful and mis uh, harmful uh, consequences and 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 misuse. Um, so, for example, this is a 2020 um, paper um, where they show that um, when you use um, so a, an algorithm that is used um, very widely in the US, um, um, which affects millions of patients, um, that this algorithm exhibits significant racial biases. And it is potentially important also to know that these biases arise not, um, not just from the uh, biases in the data, but also from the way the algorithm is, is, is the purpose of the algorithm and the training of the algorithm. The bias arises because the algorithm predicts healthcare costs rather than illness. Uh, and, um, and that generates an um, inequality of opportunity were already disadvantaged um, parts of the communities. Um, so um, how does that look like in uh, the field of ep uh, epigenetics? Um, so this is a growing field of research, but it's, it's um, not as well studied yet, I think. Also, the concerns are also present and potentially bigger um, even than in, um, in, in genomics. So I want to say, the purpose of this lecture is not to give you any answers. Um, it's not to, um, it's also something that I'm only started to be interested more or less recently. So I don't think I, I, I could give you any of the answers, 
but I would like to invite you in particular when you come from like myself from an area which is potentially more like on the computational side or the physics side um, to actually think beyond the technical details of your work and to start thinking also about wider implications of our um, research and, and work and how can we discuss and, and, and work together in an interdisciplinary way to maybe solve some of these problems. So most of the questions um, have to do, I would say, um, with um, a couple of factors. Some of them are autonomy, privacy, equal opportunities and responsibilities. Uh, so very big questions um, that need to be answered. And I'm giving you a couple of examples where these, these questions could come into, into place. So the one example would be assume that you have an epigenetic test um, that can show that there's an increased risk for lung cancer. And this increased risk is a direct consequence of the choice of smoking, okay? So in this case, you could argue then that the health system might want to account for patients' responsibility on this action. And you would put the uh, responsibility to some extent onto, um, and, and then you would might want to put the responsibility more towards, towards the patient. Uh, in another scenario, you might have uh, find, you might find that a specific environmental toxins like pollution, plastic components, use of pesticides or hormones in food all influence disease onset um, via um, epigen epigenetic mechanisms. And in this case, the question then would be who's liable uh, for such expositions. Um, so is it is the policy makers, are the, is, the, is the public more, um, is it more important, should they have their bigger responsibility to protect individuals, the society and potentially even further generations? Uh, so these kind of questions have a lot to do about, um, can we evaluate the consequences of lifestyle habits on health? through epigenetic biomarkers. So can epigenetic biomarkers, or I think we can do that. So we can use epigenetic biomarkers in the future to evaluate the consequences of lifestyle habits and health. Um, so, and that are then a very important question of rights, which, which um, touch on the question, where's the limit of individual responsibility of their own or even the next generation's health? Um, there are also other problems, I think, in these data sets. So, um, the social and political structures could influence the risk of epigenetic-based um, um, diseases. Uh, so in this case, low socioeconomic classes are most likely to be um, mostly epigenetically um, in a uh, most in a more epigenetically disfavored situation. And then in that context, vulnerable populations are at higher risk of social discrimination in inequality in the universal access to epigenetic-based medical care. Um, so these are really big questions to answer for the future as this field is maturing and moving on. Um, I want to say maybe there's, there's already some protection in the sense um, of how our data sets are being used. And as scientists, I think we very often um, despise um, some of these um, constraints and mechanisms that slow down our research. They are really hum they are really roadblocks sometimes to access data. Um, um, but I think they have very important um, functions. So one of these things is the general data protection regulation, GDPR, which was introduced by the European Union. Um, and it really um, is meant to protect the way um, um, data is used. Um, it is based on the charter or the principles are kind of derived back from to the chart of the fundamental rights of the European Union. Uh, and it comes back to the question and, and, the, the, and, and in particular at article eight of that, um, which um, concerns the protection of personal data. Uh, so um, this is important in that sense because it says that everyone has the right to the protection of personal da data concerning him or her, and such data must be processed fairly for specific purposes on the basis of the consent of the person concerned or some other legitimate basis laid down by law. Everyone has the right of access data which has been collected concerning him or her and the right to have it rectified. 
um, compliance with this rule shall be subject to control by an independent authority. So um, this, this is quite relevant, I think, to protect um, not just the, 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 to protect the human. So the, it's, it's, I think what we have seen from the example with the dissecting the racial biases is that we have multiple interests. One of them is to receive the best healthcare um, that we potentially want, but we also need our um, human rights to be protected. And sometimes um, these are in conflict to each other and we have to um, somehow find ways to do that. And the, 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 um, there are also uh, um, economical uh, interests in play to organize the health of the pop the health of a population, for example. Um, so, but so to go back to understand why these these kind of frameworks are very important, despite um, you know lots of scientists sometimes hating them, I think we have to look back where they come from, um, and that's what I want to do here to some extent. So I think these ethical guidelines have been put forward mainly for um, practitioners, for doctors, for medical um, staff. Um, but at least for myself, coming from physics and, medic and, and, and computer science and then moving into biology, studying firstly um, uh, plants and worms and model organisms, and only lastly moving into um, working with human data, these were not so relevant um, for me until rather recently. Um, and I think that um, as machine learning and genomics is becoming ever more powerful, it is really important that we understand where these guidelines, where these ethical guidelines are coming from, frameworks are coming from. So I think, um, and also, um, I think it's also important because increasingly um, algorithms will support doctors in making their decisions. And while these um, guidelines have been developed for, for doctors, it is now also um, technicians and engineers and um, computer scientists who are programming algorithms who have a huge inf impact on um, the health of individuals and the health of populations. So I think we need to understand where these, uh, where these guidelines are coming from. So historically, there's of course the Belmont report from 1979, um, which is uh, from the US Department of Health, uh, Education and Welfare, and it puts down ethical principles and guidelines for research involving human subjects. So even if you're only using bits and bytes, we are still using uh, working with human um, data. And so I think this is something quite uh, useful to look at. There's the Declaration of Helsinki, which also puts down um, ethical principles for medical research involving human subjects, including research on identifiable human material and data. And all of them really go back to the Nuremberg Code from 1947. Um, so this is, was a consequence of the doctor's trials um, after um, the uh, Nazi regime in Germany. And they, uh, for the first time, set out 10 points on permissible medical experiments. And I do want to go a little bit, and I know that this is um, potentially um, a bit breathtaking and not what you have been expecting for today, but here I want to also go a bit into the history, what went wrong uh, in, in the history of sciences. Why did we uh, have to establish these ethical guidelines? And that um, brings me um, back, and that's very much motivated again by this paper um, by Angela, uh, where she says that when science is viewed in isolation from the past and politics, it's either easier for those with bad intentions to revive dangerous and discredited ideas. Okay, um, so historical context, context, why do we need ethical guidelines? Why did the Nuremberg Code um, were um, becoming, um, how did they become um, so important? And um, I think it has uh, its origin in a, uh, in, in a really very, at the time, modern project, which caused, which we know now know, of course, that it was a terrible mistake and it was eugenics. Um, at the time, it was considered a very modern project, politically progressive. It was inspired by Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection, and it was studying exactly heritable traits which were spreading through the human population. 
Uh, it was, in fact, the science of human heredity of the time. And the goal was to improve human population through um, selective breeding. Um, so at the time, it was a very considered a very positive, um, um, beneficial project to really improve the human population as a whole. And it was at the forefront um, of scientific discovery. And it was mainly driven by, um, or it was largely driven by two people um, in, in, in London at UCL, um, Sir Francis Galton, who was a cousin of Charles Darwin's. And, um, and uh, he um, was a biometrician, a statistician, a psychologist. Um, he created the statistical concept of correlation and he attempted to study um, how genius and greatness is inherited from fathers to son. And one of his protégés was Carl Pearson, um, who um, established, really established the discipline of statistics, um, but he was the chair of eugenics at UCL. So we had at, the, at that time, we had two very powerful scientific um, new emerging fields. We had genetics and statistics, and they were coming together and they were proving to be very powerful, but in some sense, in a much much darker and 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 gloomier way than than they had anticipated, I suppose. So um, they targeted a couple of traits for elimination. So um, the traits um, that they targeted were all very complex. They were subjectively defined char characteristics, not very well understood at the time. They um, included bipolar disorders, epilepsy, alcoholism, um, criminality, and also something like feeble-mindedness, which is in general a moral defect, which they argued would lead to crime, laziness, financial burden on the normal. And the causes of these traits were seen as purely genetic, and they completely in, um, dismissed environmental factors, including poor housing, nutrition, discrimination, and so on. Um, so eugenic was widely endorsed in the literature at the time. Um, it was um, described um, by the science magazine as a work of solid merit, for example. So what I want to want, what I want to understand here is that it's really not a fringe movement, um, but it was at the core of the establishment of science. So science in itself is not necessarily an argument for being right. Um, it spread from the UK to the United States. Um, there was a eugenics record office set up at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. Um, there was uh, Charles Davenport was the director at the time. He published this Charles Davenport Creed. I encourage you to read that. It's 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 quite um, scary. Um, and um, they went on to um, find a classification of feeble-minded persons based on. Beneath Simon intelligence scale, the IQ scale, um, and then decided which of the individuals were unfit for society, which had to be institutionalized or sterilized um, or both. And they also introduced a testing programs on Ellis Island to identify the feeble-minded who would um, immigrate to the United States. So in many cases, it was also um, um, connected with race sciences, to be honest. So what it led to in the uh, eugenics in the United States led to the state uh, state enforced sterilization, um, and um, in total over sixty thousand individuals individuals were legally sterilized in the U.S. through the early nineteen seventies and even early nineteen eighties. So quite late that it was actually abolished. And um, you probably all know that there was a next level of eugenics in Nazi, Nazi Germany, um, where um, in 1920, already with theoretical work, um, these two men uh, made a legal case for the permission to destroy life unworthy um, of life. Um, that then led um, to a huge, uh, this was indeed put into practice um, during Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, so there was a law passed in 1933 uh, for the pre prevention of progeny with hereditary defects, uh, which introduced compulsory sterilization. 
Uh, and even more tragically, in 1939, when the war broke out, there was also a memorandum on the de destruction of life, unworthy of life. And immediately, um, um, patients in psychiatric hospitals were targeted for, for deaths. 70,000 patients in total under this action um, T4 were in initially targeted, and they um, um, they did... Um, so, so it's, it wasn't completed, but uh, one of every thousand people in Germany would have been affected. Um, so there was a huge, um, yeah, killing of of patients, in particular in psychiatric hospitals, going on. Uh, and this really led uh, to the Nuremberg Code, the Declaration of Helsinki, and the Bolmond Report. And then also, this is what the European Charter of Human Rights is, is referring to when you, um, when you look at the history of that. The eugenics program largely shut down. Uh, forced sterilization in the US did not end until the 1980s. So that's not such a long, um, long time ago. But this is why these um, ethical guidelines which might sometimes, which we might be sometimes tired about, or which we think sometimes is a burden to our research, are so important, and they remain important today. I think the topic is also um, um, uh, relevant in the 2020s. So um, I want to say very firmly that eugenics is wrong, um, but some people would argue eugenics is morally wrong, but it might still work. Um, so here's a very um, a famous example, which Dawkins has said in a tweet, it's one thing to deplore eugenics on ide uh, ideological, political, moral grounds. It's quite another to conclude that it wouldn't work in practice. Of course it would. It works for cows, horses, pigs, dogs, and roses. Why on earth wouldn't it work for humans? Facts ignore ideology. Um, so, um, so is it is it just is it just morally bad, and would it still work? Is that actually true? And I think again, if we are looking about genetics and 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 how um, genetics control disease and also epigenetics, this is a very um, important question. If that would actually work to some extent. Um, are the assumptions that are made here actually true? Are they, do they hold? What, is, what, what assumptions does eugenics actually make? Can we actually deprove them scientifically, not just morally? <laughs> to some extent, it is actually a, a, I was wondering, preparing these slides, this is actually a legitimate question to ask whether eugenics has worked. Um, but but I think it is important um, because people are raising these questions again. Um, so there's there's an interesting paper um, that studies um, schizophrenia, and schizophrenia was one of the diseases that was particularly attempted by by the Nazis to be eradicated through the psychiatric uh, genocide. So it is estimated that 200 and between uh, 220,000 and 269,000 individuals with schizophrenia were either sterilized or killed by the Nazis. So that was between 73% and 100% of individuals with schizophrenia living in Germany between 1939 and 1945. So a very, very substantial amount of these um, patients or diagnosed people with schizophrenia were, were indeed affected. It turns out that in the 1970s, the incidence for schizophrenia in Germany was actually higher than in the international comparison. So in this case of schizophrenia, eugenics did not work. Um, so why is that? What are the biological assumptions that are underlying eugenics? So the first one that um, assumption is that diseases such as schizophrenia were believed to be simple Mendelian inherited diseases, which are passed down from generation to generation. We now know, however, that schizophrenia is a very complex disease and that there's a large number of variants which all have a low penetrance and all of these variants, uh, variants contribute. 
Um, so what does penetrance mean? It means that there's a large proportion, that the proportion of individuals with a particular genetic variant um, that have the disease. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so there's a large number. So if you have um, a low penetrance, that means that there's a large number of individuals which have this genetic variant, but are not affected by the disease. Okay. So um, you, you have, even in the healthy population, you have, um, uh, you, you find the same genetic variants. Um, and that's, that's described by the term penetrance. <laughs> Uh, and only two to seven percent of the individuals that are carrying high risk copy number variations um, actually have the disease. Um, so it's very difficult. Um, so there's a complex interplay of a large number of um, um, of variants which all contribute, and it's not um, inherited in a simple Mendelian uh, way. So um, if uh, individual variants yield very small effects. Perhaps linear combinations could explain the effects, or maybe more complex um, combinations uh, could explain the effects. And what has become very fashionable is to compute polygenic um, risk scores. And to some extent, these have been um, uh, very um, successful uh, and very, very, um, but they also um, are sometimes massively oversold. Um, so their predictive power is still very low. And that is shown, for example, in, in this example, which is <clears throat> which is explaining an outbreak of polygenic scores for coronary artery disease, slightly uh, a different disease. Um, but what it shows is that um, the polygenic risk scores for the healthy versus the um, um, uh, disease population really overlap massively. And um, a cutoff will lead uh, to missing out um, uh, to a high number of false positives and a high number of false negatives. Um, so it's still not uh, a, a good tool um, for um, predicting disease based on um, even a, a large number of genetic variants in many cases. Also, um, they have completely dismissed. Uh, so the assumption was that schizophrenia was purely genetic, a purely genetic disease. So environmental factors were dismissed um, completely. So poor housing, nutrition, discrimination, and so on, all can contribute to, to um, discrimination. And again, we now know that um, that epigenetic factors can be uh, mediators um, between um, environmental factors and the and the, and the, and the um, disease onset. So even high risk variants carried by many most never developed schizophrenia, there's an important interplay between predisposition uh, predisposing genes and environmental exposure. Um, so um, uh, and the epigenetic regulation of the genome may mediate dynamic gene environment interactions. None of that, that has been taken into account in that context. A very um, important ex uh, example is also the Dutch uh, hunger winter in, the 19, in 1944, 1945, um, which led to a, a markedly increase in schizophrenia in Holland. Now, again, um, causality is very difficult to establish, um, but it's certainly a, a purely genetic approach is doomed to fail. And of course, it's also um, the third reason, the third assumption that um, underlay eugenics was that traits that it, such as epilepsy, but also intelligence levels, manic depression, feeble-mindedness, alcoholism, and criminality are subjectively defined, are all subjectively defined. Um, they are really difficult uh, to measure. Uh, and this problem with epigenetics has been um, identified very early on. So Thomas Hunt Morgan in the 1930s already said, the main difficulty is one of definition Accurate work on heredity can only be obtained when the diagnosis of the elements, the traits, is known. And a lot of psych uh, psychiatric diseases, in particular, it's really the um, still uh, it's, it's spectrums of diseases uh, with, with very much overlapping features, etc. So, I want to repeat here um, that there's no 
no conditioning, no moral conditioning. It's just eugenics is wrong. It's scientifically wrong. It's morally wrong. Um, but it serves as a warning um, how science in the best of the in the best of interests, even if you assume that the the purpose of this um, scientific exercise was to improve uh, the human population led into catastrophe. And um, I think we have to keep that in mind as we are moving along, studying, researching, and trying to um, find uh, cures for diseases or, um, or, or interventions. So um, if we are going back to the epigenomics, um, these are, there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Uh, and we need to have uh, not just a, a dialogue. Uh, so the interdisciplinary research doesn't have to be limited to biologists and or biologists, life scientists, medical practici practitioners and data analysts or machine learning um, practitioners, but it has much bigger consequences um, for both the individual and the society. And we have to discuss those in a much bigger context. The reason for that is of course, because it somehow defines who am I in the world? What are my connections? Um, how did, did I get to the place that I that I am in, and so on? So we are the subject. We, we are our own research subject, and in this context, we cannot assume that we are objective. The take-home messages from this. So I will leave a lot of time here for um, for discussion uh, and so on. Um, the take-home messages, which I cannot stress uh, stress. Um, um, strong enough is that we have to be really aware of our biases. Um, we have to understand where we are coming from and we have to try to understand what are value judgments and what, what are really facts. Um, I think it also shows that um, diversity in research and teaching is not just nice to have, but it does promote better sciences. Science has gone wrong in the past. Uh, and, and I think we can, by hearing many voices, um, we can improve on that. We have to be very, very careful about assumptions uh, on which we build um, our own research questions on, and we have to make sure that they hold. Um, I do think um, that we cannot just know our place. Um, so a lot of um, the past mistakes have been propagated through the leaders, through the thought leaders in the fields. So we have to question not just our own biases, but we have to questions, question our seniors. We do stand um, on, on, on massive achievements on the generations that, that come before us, but we also have to question um, what came before us. I do think that as researchers, and in particular in this field of machine learning, um, apply to biomedical data, we have an extra um, responsibility to think about the impact and the ends of our work in both um, in, in the positive sense and the negative sense. We have to think about worst case scenarios as well in order to, uh, to, to prevent them. And I do think that we have a very big responsibility to make our science understandable and to explain consequences to the public. And here are some of the references that I was quoting um, in, uh, in, in the lecture. And with that, um, I, um, I would stop. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. Thank you for this really super interesting lecture. Um, so we, we are ready to take questions from the audience. Uh, if yes, I'm gonna hand out the mic. Um, thank you very much for this uh, lecture. It was really very interesting and educational. So I just, well, it's not really a question in the sense that, well, it's a question, but well, yes, complicated, I know. But I've seen uh, some studies sometimes on epigenomics uh, trying to, for example, find uh, epigenetic, uh, mm, yeah, epigenetic uh, changes in DNA for, for, for example, predicting uh, 
if someone would be LGBTQ, for example, or also uh, trying to see if a certain type of race is uh, has a specific type of gene or epigenetic uh, thing also that would make them more intelligent. So I know that maybe the intention of the scientific uh, of the scientists that do this is not wrong, but uh, I also think that it may be dangerous in the times are, that are running now that discrimination against the race and sexuality and gender still exists. So I just wanted to ask, what do you think about this kind of studies? Uh, <clears throat> um, <laughs> I think this is very, very good questions. I think that science, um, so um, there's a, a Professor Rutherford, Dr. Rutherford, he's a um, geneticist and he's also moved into broadcasting a little bit and does very good um, programs on, on the BBC. And he once said, um, science is no ally, uh, ally, ally <laughs> sorry, to race science or racism, for example. And I can only um, I can only agree with that. I feel that we can use um, science uh, to actually debunk um, quite a lot of um, myths that are out there, uh, and and really try to understand it and and explain it. So um, so what was quite interesting for me is so this is an area that I have not studied at all, but I um, um, so we have looked at um, so so the the first is the um, the first question would be um, if there are um, epigenomic markers that predict, um, for example, um, LGBTQ T plus um, et cetera. And I, I do think those markers potentially exist and that they are actually quite relevant, um, and but relevant in the sense that we can explain um, that these are real, um, real, real issues, that they are not made up. So what we see, for example, and that's very far away from that in practice, but um, many years ago, we've been studying um, methylation changes in the mouse brain uh, postnatally, and it was really, and we changed the methylation there. And what was really fascinating was that a lot of um, genes were affected that are um, in the literature described um, to be um, sex determining um, um, genes, and that would be expressed um, actually rather in sperm or in uh, in uh, ovaries and so on. But it turns out that postnatally, a lot of these genes are actually uh, expressed in a specific way in the brain. And I think um, that we have a, 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 gender a gender representation, uh, an identity that establishes in the brain. And there's a lot of things can go wrong in biology always. And it doesn't have to, and sometimes this could be in, in uh, so in, in, a, in, a, in a condition, it could be that um, what, what is, that, it, that there's a mismatch to what is expressed in the brain and for whatever reasons, and these could be um, contributed by um, epigenomic factors. And I very much understand that this would um, cause huge problems for the people that are affected and that is invisible and uh, it is not a matter, it's certainly not a matter of choice. You cannot choose to be um, someone uh, and you can't be re-educated to be someone that you are not. Um, and if we understand the basis of that, that could actually help um, to um, promote um, understanding in, in, in the society, I think. Um, so I think there's a lot of, I think epigenomics there plays a huge importance. I think also what we are seeing is that trauma um, and in particular early childhood trauma um, is, um, is kind of recorded with epigenomic patterns also largely in the brain. And if we understand that, and, and this can be caused by discrimination by all kinds of um, uh, experiences. And if we understand that in a better way, I think we could also help to overcome these traumas. Um, and to have better ways in, in, in uh, reversing these effects. Uh, what was the other question? Um, so 
yeah, so I, I think that understanding biological um, causes um, is a good thing. Explaining, uh, explaining biological causes is a good thing. I, I think that it's very important how you are framing question, your research question. So I think it is also quite important to understand, for example, why um, it might be a, a decent research question to understand um, why certain children are struggling to learn and others are um, having, a, having an easier time. Um, but combining that with a different question, which is differences in races or differences in gender or sex is I think putting on a mind model onto a biological question. So there's no reason um, to believe in the first place that because your skin pigmentation is different, that should have an effect on your cognitive abilities. These are completely, if you're thinking about it, it's completely independent of each other. So if you are, if you are trying to find um, uh, associations between intelligence and skin pigmentation, then I think you have almost an agenda. I think it makes sense to study how skin pigmentation is inherited, and it's it's very complex and fascinated. It's also interesting to understand how intelligence and cognitive abilities are working. Putting these two together has, for me, no bio, no scientific merit, and um, and potentially comes with a value judgment. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, thank you for your insight. So thank you, Gabriela. Yes, I, I would like to add that really this is a, a very powerful message uh, that is important for us all as scientists, but especially for you who are uh, early researchers, early stage researchers. You, we have the responsibility in avoiding that science is weaponized uh, and to perpetuate inequalities. It should be the other way around, okay? So let, let's see if there are other questions in the audience, please. Um, in the previous lectures, we talked about uh, like red syndrome and there are uh, illnesses and syndromes that are quite clearly something that we know we want to search a cure for, but there are other disorders, I think especially dealing with neurodivergencies, but with a lot of illnesses that we don't really know what where to draw the line, where to call something a disorder, an illness, or just something that's, that creates challenges, but that might not be due only to the disorder itself, but maybe to the way society works. So how can we know when to stop, when to uh, stop searching for a cure for something because it actually doesn't need one? I think that is a very, very difficult question to ask, which I find, um, um, I think that's a very, very difficult question to ask. It's also a very, I have to say, I mean, there are very different perspectives on it. Um, I know one of the families um, who have a boy with over, MECP2 overexpression syndrome who sadly died. Um, uh, just before COVID in 2019, and I followed their story a little bit and how they, you know, um, how they, um, uh, you know, were basically living in the hospital with that boy and they were desperate for a cure. And to some extent, um, there were some scientists who were feeding into that um into that hope uh, and telling them, okay, we need one more, another one hundred, mil uh, another million uh, dollars uh, before we can start with clinical trials. We have something that works in mice. Maybe we can do that for uh, find a cure in this case. And um, so this mother, in addition to caring for her child, would also do a lot of. She was very much involved in fundraising and charity, and and charities for that disease and so on. 
And um, I think it gave her it gave her hope, and uh, not just for her boy, but for for um, that the life of her boy was not uh, in vain, and that was a very personal story. At the same time, I heard some of the scientists and 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 doctors say, maybe you know this these children we are doing so much at the beginning of their lives to save them um and um their life is really a life of suffering and where do we where we where, where is the care where is it more um dignified to to stop and let someone die rather than um f- f- moving on um it's it's these are questions that I, I wouldn't dare to answer. I think they are also it, but it's it's questions that we have to confront in some some sense, I suppose. Um in other senses, I completely agree. I think we have to be more um instead of we have to create also more opportunities um for people that have some kind of challenging health conditions um, to not to eradicate the trait or the the disease, but to make it easier for them to live in the society and to remove the hurdles. Very difficult questions. Thank you. Um, I guess to some extent, what I also find very um, interesting is that, for example, um, when you are looking at life expectancy, um, for the, for example, in the UK, um, it is it is quite shocking that life expectancy has started to um, so at the other end of um, so not the beginning of life and and being born with challenging conditions, but more towards what's the life expectancy of the population. And um, it turns out that the life expectancy is is, is the rise of li- life expectancies has. Um, is starting to decrease and it's starting and that happened before this trend started before COVID actually and it, it turns out that again we can separate um, different so- socioeconomic um, uh, parts of the population and the decrease in life expectancy happens much stronger in uh, in the more vulnerable uh, groups of our, our society and I think there are some 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 interesting questions here. So we are trying to um, improve. We have improved on cancer. We have improved on all kinds of um, diseases. We have. It was a huge um, success in the last decades in, in in scientific breakthrough, but it hasn't translated really to benefit everybody. And a lot of other things like public um, health invention, uh, interventions, poor housing, education, food. Uh, which is which is uh, which would give um, equal opportunities might be actually more efficient than um, personalized and precision medicine. Uh, so uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it was very good and intense. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Two questions actually. The first one is. So if something could be done, it's not necessary to be to do it, right? So I was wondering if in field of epigenetics, there are examples of such things that like that. And my second question is, um, well, how a lot did the scientists actually learn from what happened in the past, at least in epigenetics field, or it's very, or it's how what's the alarming level like is it alarming these times for us regarding field of epigenomics at least what do you think so i don't want to put eugenics and epigenomics i think i've mentioned them in the same lecture but i think it does go beyond uh, it's not not specific to epigenomics i do think that we see very specific challenges at the moment because we have again um similar to the so st- statistics and genetics came together and and they were very powerful, but they went into the, the wrong direction um, or into a very traumatic uh, traumatic direction. And we are at a similar time where we have incredible powerful um, genetics and sequencing technologies, and we have at the at the same time these huge um, improvement in machine learning and how to analyze these data sets. 
And um, we do see that some people suggest, for example, that you can pr predict the intelligence from um, from your germline, and and that you can make um, you know your whole life fate is predictable. And I find that very difficult um, to to swallow. Um, I think I think it's not just science. I mean, it's all all us. I think we we we. Um, I think in many in many cases. We are telling people to trust science. Um, we did that during COVID and we did that for climate change. And I think that is right. It's it's important that we trust science, but at the same time, we have to be worthy of that. I mean, as scient scientists, we have to be super self-critical and we have to be understanding of the risks that we are um that's that science comes with um and sometimes it's like we are we are we are you know producing a car and um sending out a car but it has only accelerators and no brake system and i think when we are building these cars we have to think about the brake system and that's that's what i'm trying to do here as well so i think but it's not just for for scientists right it's not uh, I think um, there were politicians who were very much in, uh, involved in eugenics. There were kind of, it was in the community levels. There were doctors, um, there were medical staff. It was a lot of people bought into eugenics at the time. And I think the response of it was the Nuremberg Code. It was the Helsinki, Helsinki, Helsinki Declaration. It was um, the, so as a society, we have learned from it. And it's important that we do not unlearn these lectures. It's important that we understand that as scientists, that mechanisms that slow us down, like GDPR, which is based on the European Chart of um, Human Rights, that these have an important function and that we are not trying to remove the safeguards again. Thank you. Uh, don't see any other uh, questions here in the audience and in the chat uh, either. So I think that with that, uh, we can conclude. Thank you. Thank you really so much, uh, Gabriel, for the beautiful series of lectures. And Very welcome. Uh, have a lovely day. We truly hope to have you here in person sometime soon. I would enjoy that. <laughs> Thank Take you. care and enjoy the rest of your your summer uh, your winter school. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thanks for the organization as well. Sure, of course. Bye. Bye.